I'm Vivian Nutton. I'm a retired professor at University College London, but I'm also a professor of the history of medicine in Moscow. And I have worked on the classical tradition in European and Islamic medicine from the Greeks until the 18th century and indeed beyond. Vivian, you've worked on many medical commentaries. Can you give us an idea of the kind of commentaries that you work on? What are the languages they're written on? When were they written? By whom were they written? If we know that, why were they written? And what do they look like? If you hold them in your hand, what are they written on? Um, how big are they? Um, how were they transmitted? You make, you make one mistake in assuming that there's one type of commentary. It's a long tradition that is constantly changing. It begins with the Greeks. We can find it in Latin, in Syriac, Arabic, Hebrew. It comes back in the Western Med Middle Ages in Latin. And in fact, is still continuing the 19th century in Berlin that lectures on the Greek Hippocrates were given in Berlin in the middle of the 19th century and indeed in Bologna until the First World War. So it's a long tradition of teaching using a set text. That's extremely interesting. Um, what is the reason for the longevity of this tradition? Um, it's very surprising that it's still going on in the 19th century in Berlin. What are the purposes which these commentaries serve? No doubt also multiple. There are two purposes. One is to, to give the medical student a sense of tradition. We are doctors and we go back a long way. And that in a sense gives us an authority. And secondly, some of these texts, and particularly Hippocrates aphorisms, are so obscure that you can use them as the basis to introduce almost anything you want from ancient texts right through to the latest discoveries. So they're a kind of Rorschach blot upon which the professor can project his or her hobby horse. <laughs> that is for some of them. For others, they are seen as the fundamentals of medical practice, and you can remember them. Most of the texts they use are short, so they are memorable, or they can be bought cheaply. Mm -hmm. And therefore, you can carry them with you all your working life. Let, let me um, push you a little bit on these purposes. Um, it's extremely interesting what you say about the doctor's consciousness and pride in their very long tradition. As a historian of science, such sentiments are not, of course, foreign to scientists. They, too, like to evoke their pantheon of ancestors from Aristotle, Galileo, Newton, Helmholtz. But they do not choose to honor them through commentaries on their works. That ended sometime probably in the early 18th century. What's special about medicine? I think it's special with the name of Hippocrates, who is seen as the father. And because by the time you get to printed books, Hippocrates and his importance have been going for 1,500 years at least. But there's also a sense in which you can use commentary to honour your own professor, because some commentaries are made by students on the books of their professor, right down to the 17th century, which is surprising. Yes, it, 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 it is surprising and suggests that there's a very special community or concept of community uh, that underlies these commentaries. You mentioned at the outset that this is a polyglot tradition, it is a very enduring tradition, and it is a geographically dispersed tradition over the entire Mediterranean basis and also transalpine. Um, that is a very impressive community, which at least notionally can trace its continuity back to a founding figure, however mythical, in Hippocrates, but also can convince of such otherwise very diverse cultures. Can we say more about the implicit idea of community that underlies these commentary traditions? Well, we love to have the view of schools almost as institutions. But schools is, is an ambiguous word. And when you find the Greek word, it's household or community of people talking to each other. 
And if you go, for instance, to the Middle East in a mosque, you find people teaching the Quran to people sitting around the floor in front of them as a community, and you derive your authority in the Muslim world by having a, a, a certificate signed saying, I have heard this text under the direction of Sheikh whatever. So that it's, it's important that the personal link is there, mm -hmm. and the personal link really continues right through until possibly in the 1960s, when medical students grew in large numbers. That, that's extremely interesting, especially the use of the word oikos, household. Um, most people will be familiar with at least one aspect of Hippocratic teachings, which is the preference given to sons of doctors. Yeah. To what extent does this very long train of master-student relationships create an ersatz family, an ersatz paternity um, between the master and the student? Sometimes it is deliberately created. Sometimes the master tell you are very proud to be the pupil and you can go back with a long tradition of names. Sometimes it is transferred to an institution. Think of being in Yale or Cambridge or Berlin and therefore that sense which is, which is there in the institution also gives weight to the value of the lectures you've heard. Not coincidentally called the alma mater, um, no. again an ersatz parent um, created. Is there also an empirical dimension, especially to the medical commentaries, given the enormous variability of the human body? Observations cannot be too many. Even if a syndrome or an, a malady has been described in detail, there will always be individual variations, which it might be useful to preserve for other physicians, future generations of physicians. Um, is that a function that the co medical commentaries? Yes, partic particularly when you have texts which, are, which definitely are written as introductory texts, which are, in a sense, unintelligible to the beginner without the father figure explaining what is happening and giving reminiscences from his, and it is of course almost entirely his down to the 20th century, his experiences which are given to the pupil in a sense privately. Because if you aren't there, you can't hear the word. When they are written down, the word becomes a little more widespread. But the voice is there, the, the demonstration, the pointing to the observation is there and you can only get that in the actual room with the individual. I, I wonder, we've been talking about medical commentaries, but of course there are also commentaries about materia medica, about the pharmacopoeia. And there, at least in the early modern period in Europe, there is an appeal to um, people who are not men exclusively, who are not university trained, may not be physicians at all, um, perhaps heterodox, practitioners of medicine. Do you see a real difference between the commentaries on the Materia Medica and those which are part of the Hippocratic and Galenic lineage? Sometimes, you, sometimes, the, sometimes the non-expert information is invoked. Sometimes it is invoked with approval that this person got to found the technique correctly, even though they did not know the theory behind it. And in my teaching, I will explain why it works. More often than not, it is quoted to be derided because these didn't know what they were doing and they make all these funny mistakes. And if you learn the proper method, you will be a successful practitioner and you will know how to avoid these mistakes. What surely every young doctor wants to believe. Thank you very much, Vivian. <laughs>